Good morning, ACP. I'm your host, Stephen Yamada with OETC, and welcome to Web and File Accessibility, The Real Story. Before we get started, a few bits of housekeeping. This session is being recorded, and if you have any questions during the presentation, put them in chat, and we'll answer them at the end if there's time. Uh, with that out of the way, I'd like to welcome our speaker, Melissa Gardner, Director, IT Governance, Policy, and Strategy at the Oregon Department of Education. Melissa, take it away. Good morning, everyone. There are a couple of polls in the polls tab for you, just to get a sense of who is here this morning. And um, if you would take a moment to answer those, it gives me a sense. Um, normally, if you are all here, I'd have you raise your hands, but of course, it's a little challenging right now. Um, there's also a link that Stephen has kindly added. It's also on your screen. It's a link to the slide deck. That is a link that will be active forever. You are welcome to browse the slide deck. It's got some links to resources that you'll probably want to have access to in the future. And um, hello to the people that have said hello to me, some of my former friends at Salem Kaiser. Um, you're still friends. I'm just not at Salem Kaiser anymore. So I'm going to take a look at the poll. Um, oof, we have three people under oversight. So excited for you. I am at my desk at the Public Service Building. Um, at, oh, that's P, uh, sorry, that's ODE's building. And so you may hear other voices in the background. That's not surprising. Um, there's not very many of us here, but there are a few, so. All right. The question I didn't get a chance to put into the polls this morning, but I am interested in finding out is if you had um, to pick one or all of these, which are you most interested in finding out? It's kind of the story of ODE and how do you get out of oversight from OCR? That's definitely one of one of the things we'll talk about. Um, what does web accessibility look like? How do you make websites accessible? Um, how do you make files accessible or all three of those? And if you wouldn't mind answering that in chat for me, that would be fantastic. Uh, we're gonna cover all three, but sort of getting a sense of where you wanna spend more of the time would be great. Ah, staff buy-in, yes. Uh, Kurt, I, I don't know if you've heard the good news, but ODE is actually out of oversight. We actually exited oversight from OCR. So, yes, I will tell you how that goes and what. And we're just about to ex exit oversight for OSD. So, um, we have um, there's hope. And Kurt, it's it's less painful than you possibly thought, which is good news. All right, we'll just jump in and um, we'll get started and we'll talk about what we've learned, what we know, and what it looks like to be accessible as an agency. Um, I'll get back to the slide deck. Oh, so we're going to be talking about a brief history of how or how to survive an OCR complaint. So here's a little bit about our timeline. Our original complaint was in May 2016. And one of the things that we did immediately is we set up a new website. The old website we were using was pretty much, um, if you're familiar with ODE's website, um, how, how in the world could you make it accessible? It was really impossible. So we brought up a new website. It's built on a um, classic SharePoint backend. Uh, so that's our back end. And our, our migration from the old website to the new website was complete in March. We hired a web accessibility technician. This is somebody who sits and babysits the back end of the website to make sure that it's accessible in the spring of 2019. And we finished up remediating all of our tier one files. So those are, it was roughly 50% of the files on our website that were posted to our website in September. And then we we closed our complaint. We actually closed our complaint in January of 2021. So 
from May 2016 to January 2021, we were actually under oversight um, to a greater or lesser degree. So our, we were scheduled to be out of oversight in November of 2020 uh, and then heard nothing. So we were done in November with all the things that we needed to do, but we didn't hear from OCR for a while. So how did we get it done? It was really an alliance of several people. It wasn't just an IT department saying you shall. It wasn't just a, our legal department where our um, civil rights advocate sits. It wasn't just our civil rights advocate sitting and saying you have to. It wasn't just um, someone in our management team. It was an alliance of all of those people, um, our communications department, our training folks, everyone got together and made this happen. I think if any one person or if any one part of our agency had said that this is important, it would have failed. Um, and certainly as we move forward, if any one part of our agency owns this effort, it will continue, it will fail. Uh, this has to be a systemic change or it doesn't, it's not sustainable by any stretch. There were lots of work streams. We stood up work streams for um, obviously a steering committee to do the work, but we also had a training work stream that worked on all the training materials. Um, we had a program and policy work stream. So once this gets out of being in a project status where we're doing the stuff that OCR requires, how do we keep it going? Um, they're the ones that develop the positions that we have um, both currently and hopefully <laughs> when we have a pop approved, that's the, oh no. Can you guys see me? Okay. Yes, we can see you. Your slide deck is longer I just, I, the slide deck just went down. I got an, uh, you may be con disconnected screen. So let me try this again. Um, That was fun. So I came into ODE so that I wouldn't get disrupted connections and here I am with a disrupted connection. That's fun. All right, so um, really what it came down to is lots of work by lots of people all over the agency. Um, we insisted, <laughs> um, we insisted, Hey, so sorry, there was a strobing effect on the slides. Wow. Which, uh, ironically, yeah, let's not do that. Okay, yeah. so. <laughs> um, uh, maybe just try one more time with the reshare. Actually, I'm going to back out and do this and share it this way. Is that better? That works for me, yes. I don't see any strobing. Okay, so oh. you get to see the whole... No. Looks like it's strobing again. All right. Um, let me try. I've got your slide deck pulled up. I will can pull it up on my screen, and <laughs> you can just tell me when to advance. It's going to be amazing. No, we're we're doing it live with technology. That's right. And no, just it's fun. not accessible, Kurt, with the strobing <laughs> effect. I think that's particularly <laughs> not accessible. Indeed. <laughs> uh, uh. Okay. Give me just a moment to get that queued up. You should all know that I cheered when I had Steven in the back end on this deck, right? There we go. Great. Yeah. Okay. okay. Can you remind me Steve, which there slide? One, one. Uh, one more. One more. Great. Yeah. So when we estimated our cost over the scope over the scope of the project, so all of and we this is based on some guesses. Um, we spent approximately in staff time, largely. Um, this is not money that we put out. This is this is what we spent in staff time. We spent about 1.2 million over the course of five years. Um, this is not an easy thing to do. This is not a small commitment. And to Heather's question about what what does this take to sustain? What does this take to make happen? It takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of commitment and it takes a culture shift. Um, it, it, it is everything from onboarding to um, reminding to posters. Um, actually, that poster that you can see in the background is one of the posters we have up all over our agency when we're here. 
um, to remind people that accessibility is important. So, Stephen, if you could go to the next one for me. So these are what we have to sustain the effort. We have in information technology, so in our IT shop, we have um, our highest classification. Um, this is, these are state classifications. We have our highest classification, who is our web expert. And um, he does things like uh, when we find an accessibility error because our communications department is trying to communicate something in a particular way and <laughs> Here's a real example. So they put up a single word, a single white word on a colored background to bring attention to something on our website. It's a violation of accessibility. You cannot put text on a colored background and have it be accessible. Even if you put alt text behind it to say what that word is, it's wrong to do it. And so he built code in CSS that will give you a colored background that you can type over the top of and put white text on it. Uh, that's so, the, so those are the kind of fixes that he does. He gives us the, the elegant stuff in the background that makes the website do amazing things. We have that three, so if you look lower, right? So it's a far lower classification that just sits there and looks at all the HTML in the background and says, is this accessible? So one of the delightful side effects of making our website easy to edit is that every time you make a change to the inside the template that they give you, if you make a change and you click in a new frame, but don't make any changes and then go, I'm not going to put anything in there and save the web page and exit, it puts an empty P tag in and you don't see it because it's an HTML. So we have somebody on the back end cleaning up all of our HTML. We also have <laughs> yes, an extra space. Uh, uh, we also have the person who was in our three position, just got uh, promoted to a four, and he is now doing app application accessibility. So how is it that we make all of our applications accessible? And we're not just doing our public facing applications anymore. We're doing all of our applications. Um, we're taking the step to make sure that everything's accessible because honestly, accessibility being public facing only lasts as long as we don't have a, um, a an employee who needs the the, uh, the accommodations to use our tools. So we know it's coming and we're just taking the steps to make it work now. In communications, we have the single point of contact for our website. That's a, a technical designation that the state gives to somebody in the agency who is responsible for the website. Um, that person lives in communications. And in our legal department, we're going to be hiring um, a particular classification. It's a different classification for the file accessibility expert um, who will maintain the policy for accessibility and all the training materials that are related to accessibility. Um, we have a policy in the agency that says everything public facing must be accessible. Uh, and that is just, at, we, had, we haven't had that position. Um, we've had it defined and ready to go. Uh, we actually had someone chosen to fill that position on a temporary basis. Then COVID hit and um, it was a job rotation and their current manager wouldn't let them go for some funny reason. Um, so we haven't actually had that person. We haven't had that role filled. And so here I am talking about file accessibility, even though I'm an IT manager now, because I'm, I'm the person who knows it the best in the agency. So I still do that as well. Uh, we still have steering committee champions. All the people that were on the steering committee are still with the agency and they will talk about accessibility to anyone who will hear them because they've been through the whole thing. And we've made some very distinct cultural changes. Um, one of those is that accessibility and talking about accessibility is part of our onboarding process. Um, you don't get to be in part of the agency without hearing our commitment to ongoing accessibility for all of our digital resources. So, all right, so, Stephen, we can move on. So Kurt, here's the good news for you. How did we exit? This is what it actually looked like. We got a call, we got an email from OCR that says we'd like to get you out of um, out of oversight. They said we're going to exit you from oversight next week. Here's the pages we're going to scan, and it was the list of pages from the original complaint. That's it. 
they got back to us with some notes about what they found on those pages, which was actually really embarrassing, honestly. That was a phone call where they went over those errors. They did not tell us how to fix those errors. They just noticed that they were there. <laughs> and we worked out a timeline on when we would get those fixed. We got those fixed. We sent them an email. They're fixed. They scanned them again without us. And they sent us a letter. And that was it. So, Kurt, good news. It's not difficult, complicated, or overly onerous. So, same thing's happening. Um, right? Um, the same thing's happening with our with Oregon School for the Deaf had a separate complaint, and um, they're working on the same process. So because OSD started, like, like us, started on a different platform for their website, moved to SharePoint for their new website, um, they are, they said, okay, here's the original list of complaints. We're now, com we just, I, I think, Right now, we are sending them the list of here's the website, here's the web pages that correlate with those pages. So here's the new links for those pages, and um, that's those are the pages that they're going to look over. So uh, that's that's it. That's how we got out. So any questions in chat? Uh, if you want to raise your hand, I don't have any issue elevating you to the stage if you want to just ask questions about what ODE is doing or has done about accessibility. And yes, go SharePoint. Although it's old SharePoint, not modern SharePoint, which is always so fun. Uh, the, the errors that they found, um, what was it? Cameron, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, it was, it, it, the reason I say embarrassing is because when they pointed them out, we were like, we should know better. So it wasn't anything shocking or horrifying. Um, a couple of them were things that we should have caught and just missed. Um, I know that before we went, got on the call, our eight, so our senior web person, did a quick scan of those pages and noticed some really egregious errors on there that we should have caught and had our three run in and make those changes before we got on the call. So I know that there were some errors like that that we had just missed. Um, so there, it wasn't anything horrifying and it wasn't anything we didn't know how to fix. Um, there were a couple of things that, um, one's in the footer that we've been arguing. So our footer is auto-generated by the state it's not generated by us. We have all state web pages have the same footer on them. And um, it finally gave us the leverage to talk to the people that generate that state, that footer at the state level and say, would you please, please, please fix this? So one of the, one of the uh, links at the bottom of every state web page is the link to the veterans website. And the, please veterans, please go visit the department of veterans affairs. Their logo doesn't have alt text. So, um, Melissa, it looks like we've got a hand raised. Would you like to hand the oh, mic to Curtis? Yeah, absolutely. Great. Get just a moment, Curtis. Curtis, you're on the stage. Okay. Hi, Kurt. Hi. How are you, Melissa? I'm good. Good. Hey, um, I I was going to put it in chat, but I couldn't figure out how to word the question, and I probably yeah. fumble here as I ask it. But did you get any indication when you were finally um, removed from oversight that all of the work and effort was a part of them saying, okay, you're done? Or was it truly just that last phase that was the, you, you understand what I'm asking? Yeah, I do understand what you're asking. And yes, there was a clear sense that they took a look at all the effort we put into reporting and following the rules and telling them what we were doing. And there was a clear effort that we've gone like honestly, we've gone way above and beyond just fixing our web page, and our commitment to accessibility far exceeds what they expected us to do, and that, um, yeah, like they're not going to push us right. on all the details. So I think you guys are going to find yourself in a very similar situation. Honestly, I hope so. And I I'm going to so hold too. you to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Most I work for the CR. <laughs> Um, we did get a new attorney. Noelle's no longer with OCR. 
Oh, that's so, interesting. Okay. Isn't it though? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, anytime. All right, Stephen, sorry, next slide. Because that's what we're doing. Oh, Other next. questions? All right. I presume that since you're here, thanks, Stephen, that you don't really need to know this why accessibility, but this is the this is part oh yeah. How to so I I think Kiro, I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, but I, this is, I think this next bit may be helpful for you to use to help your staff understand the why of accessibility and talk about how easy accessibility is. And I think it's the combination of those two things that will help with getting everyone on board with making things accessible. Um, so let me get through this part and then ask again. Like, let's see if this explains what ha what what will help, and then ask that again. Like, do some calibration after this. Is that okay? Okay. All right. Next slide. This is my first question for everyone, and I'd like to actually have you guys answer this in chat. So, in what ways have you benefited from tools designed for differently abled people? <laughs> True story, closed captioning in sports bars. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, GPS. Mm -hmm. So some things I haven't seen you guys say, uh, speech to text and text to speech. Um, the pullout drawers. Yeah, large print books, yeah. Um, the pullout drawers in your refrigerator and your kitchen cabinets. <laughs> Kurt, true. Accessibility errors drive me absolutely crazy now. Um, yep, all the translation tools. If you've not experienced Microsoft translations tools, you should honestly check them out. They're pretty incredible. Um, another thing that you might not have noticed, have you have you guys seen the Subaru commercials recently for, I think, the Foresters, um, that you, uh, it, they're playing to your parents' sensibilities about, um, Having your it's a it's, it's a commercial where there's a teenage girl who looks down at her phone, and the car stops for her to avoid something that's happening in front of her. Um, could I get a thumbs up if you know what commercial I'm talking about? And they would say, you know, keep your kids safe, right? So that is based on eye gaze technology that was recently developed for people like Stephen Hawking, who can't move anything but their eyes. So that was designed for accessibility and is now going mainstream in our cars. So it's paying attention to where you're looking to, to do some action. So uh, there are lots of ways where stuff that was designed for accessibility is helping everybody now. So similarly, things that are done for accessibility are now benefiting all people, not just people who are disabled. Okay, next slide. Um, what's the point of this slide? So, 
Kurt, I've seen that you're talking about being colorblind. We have a programmer who's colorblind. And one of the things about accessibility is that you can't represent anything with only color. Uh, so ideally, if you're putting a graph up that you would have a pattern behind the color as well as the color so that you can see the pattern uh, as well as the color to indicate differences on the graph. Um, also, color contrast. We have we have a programmer on our staff who's colorblind, and one of the checks that we do for all of our programs is run it over to his desk and say, "Can you see it?" Um, it's a fantastic check. We don't have to run it through any color contrast checkers. We just ask him. Um, one of the one of the one of the changes under COVID is that we had to work with our preschool folks, and one of the preschools was at. We asked all of our preschools to send in reopening plans, just like all of our schools did, and we got a, a request from one of our preschool directors who is blind for one of the forms that they had to turn in that wasn't accessible and was on our public website. <laughs> I just about had a cow. Um, and it was a form that somebody put up because we have to get it up right away and we're going to get back and get it accessible later. And nobody and somebody forgot it. Um, I'm like, I, yeah, I, no, this is why we don't do that. We put it up accessible first. Um, and uh, so to those of you who are talking about, you know, how do you change the culture? There are people who are. Um, with the urgency or they've got some excuse that they don't learn accessibility. And I, until there are consequences behind that continued wrong behavior and some space, honestly, like I'm not going to like really get in somebody's space about accessibility in the middle of a crisis. So we'll get there. We're not there yet. Um, and then at uh, the, the front page banner, we had a front page banner up on our webpage that was, um, that was a picture with text in it. Again, that was wrong. You can't just put a picture up that's only text. And it, it improved the look of the webpage by pulling the text out of the picture. I, we understand the look that our communications department was going for, but Again, not accessible. It just is better for everyone when accessibility is done correctly. I remember back before I started doing accessibility when I was when I was just the person fixing documents and stuff for our teaching and learning staff, um, and I got handed the um, science testing document, um, sixty-seven pages long. It was all on a table, um, and I got the chance to break that all out and put it into headers appropriately. And it was far more readable and far more understandable when you got it out of headers and now like navigable because you could just click on the links in the outline view and get to whatever part of the document you, want, you wanted to. So it's better for everybody. Um, and I would argue that just because you don't know that they're there, you have disabled folks living around you. So Stephen, would you cue up the video? People say to me, well, I don't have anyone with a disability on my team. And I laugh because 70 plus percent of disability is invisible. All of us, at some stage in our lives, will have an access need. We want to make everyone able to work together and have full access to information. I don't want people to be isolated. If you don't have accessibility, you don't have employment. It's that simple. If you don't know how accessible you are, you're not. That's like saying to the every fifth person, I don't really want your business. I'm not sure why anyone would want to turn away business like that. There are barriers to communication everywhere, but I think it's time we look at the barriers as opportunities, and then they will be broken down. The perfect future for me is when we don't even think about accessibility anymore because it's so easy, it becomes second nature. 
doing things from the get-go, not only is reasonably affordable, it actually makes the product better for everyone. Figure out how you are going to prioritize this going forward, because I promise you, the impact will and is being felt. So coming up is Global Accessibility Day. Uh, it's on May 17th. Um, that's something that if you're here, you might want to see what people are up to around the world um, to promote accessibility. Uh, so take a minute to think about that. Take a minute to reflect on what that means for you and your your de your department, the, the people you work with and the students you serve. If you wonder why I'm being so quiet for so long, introverts need more time to think than extroverts believe it's possible. So just being a little quiet so you can have a little chance to think about that. All right, let's move on to digital accessibility. <laughs> yeah, Greg, I had a dog that could open our flip handles as well. It's so much fun. Um, so there are some concepts that for digital accessibility that are applicable across the tools, across web accessibility, across um, file accessibility, right? So go ahead, the next slide. Always, 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 the most important thing is if you fit, it is always easier than if you retrofit. One of the things that is true is if you look at this picture, um, and this has great alt text behind it because it is a point that I am making in this presentation. So all the things that I say about it in my presentation are in alt text because it matters. And you'll see why that matters in a bit. But this elevator, you can't tell if it was part of the construction at the time that they built this parking garage or if it was an add-on later because it's on the outside edge of the building. Think about retrofitting some of the schools that you work in for physical, like elevator access for a physically disabled kid. If it's not built into the school at the time of construction, how much more expensive is it to put in an elevator? I know I've got Salem Kaiser people in here. Can you imagine putting an elevator in Highland? Incredibly expensive because there's no place to put an elevator except on the outside edge of a building. It's the same with file accessibility. If you don't start with file accessibility in mind, it is more expensive in terms of time and effort to make it accessible after it's done. Just to give you a perfect example of that, the RSSL guidance, the Ready School Safe Learners guidance that Oregon put out in the beginning of, um, of uh, the beginning of the first one, the first version one of that for or, for Oregon schools. Um, we developed that thing, we made it beautiful, it was laid out beautifully, and no one looked at accessibility. It was a very public document. We uh, are committed to not putting stuff out that's not accessible, especially something that's that public. Um, I'm the only one in the agency that had the time and capability of putting it together. I sat, got it on a Friday and it had to be ready to go on a Monday. And I spent seven hours with it that weekend to make it accessible. Um, if they had taken just even a little bit of a time with accessibility at the beginning, it would have taken me far, I mean like a couple of hours to fix the mistakes that they made along the way. Um, so when you start with accessibility in mind, it is much easier to do anything. 
uh, next slide is that the sad thing is that tools really only address about 50% of the accessibility issues. Um, one clear example of that is alt text. And uh, <laughs> yes, Kurt, yes, exactly. Um, tools only address about 50%, so alt text. Um, an alt text checking tool um, there are alt text checkers in all the Microsoft tools, for instance. They will check for the presence of alt text. What they can't tell you is if that alt text is correct. So the alt text might be the file path from which that picture was taken, which is completely wrong, right? That is never appropriate alt text. So yes, image of an image. Yes, that kind of thing. That's wrong. So. Yes, you can check to see if you have alt text, but what you can't check for is if the alt text is correct. So it gets about you it gets you about fifty percent of the way there. Um, but you there's still a human component to accessibility every single time. All right, next slide. So let's go over those basic components of accessibility. Headings are to be used for navigation, not for looks. So one of the big documents that we had to work on when we were doing accessibility was put together by printing and distribution who doesn't understand accessibility at all. They're getting better at it. Um, and they used heading six for a style effect every time. And it had nothing to do with the fact that it was the sixth order in it. And an outline view of the document was fun to fix. Um, so they have to be used in order. So if you think about outlining your document, you can't have a heading two without a heading one. You can't have a heading three without a heading two. They need to be in order. Um, it's an outline of your document. That's what headings are for. And those are used by screen readers to navigate through. That's true on web pages. That's true in PowerPoint. That's true in docs. It's true. It's true everywhere. Um, also, headings can't be empty. You can't have a heading with nothing underneath it. A heading is announcing what's coming after it. So you can't have a heading three as a list. So you can't format a list as heading three because those aren't headings, that's a list. <laughs> They're different. All right, next. Speaking of lists, there are two types of lists, ordered and unordered. And they can't, you shouldn't be embed a list in a paragraph. So if you're writing, um, there are seven steps you need to take to restart your computer. I don't know, whatever, right? And you would say, first you, da da da, da second you, da 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 da. No, you take that out of the paragraph. You end at the period, there's seven things you need to do to restart your computer. And then you start a list. And that list starts with one, and then two, and then three. And those are tools that are built into whatever you're using, unless you're on a web page. Um, then you have to type it. And you just use those tools to write a list care, uh, properly. Lists list using numbers and bullets are different, and they're announced differently to a screen reader. All right, next. You use formatting to change a look, right? So you use styles, not text characteristics. So you shouldn't be using just highlight a couple of words and using bold. Um, if you want to just change the look, but not the meaning of the words, you can use bold. But if you're changing the meaning of the words by bolding them, like you're trying to bring attention to them, you're trying to highlight them or make them important, you need to use the strong, uh, the strong um, style rather than bold characteristics. that trips up people fairly frequently, so I'm pausing. Um, you can't use multiple blank characters, so don't indent a line by using space, 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 space. Um, use a tab. Don't indent further into a line by doing tab, 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 tab. Adjust your tabs, or use a ruler on Word in particular, and make their tabs appear in the right place. Um, and don't do enter, enter, enter to make more space at the end of a paragraph. Um, use the paragraph spacing to make more space at the end of a paragraph. If you're going to change the color, check the contrast. The link here is a link to a color contrast checker online. Um, 
alternately you could call Kurt. Just kidding, don't call Kurt. Um, but the color contrast checker <laughs> would be, it actually puts, you put that in the hex codes for the colors and it will tell you whether it's accessible at three different sizes. So you can have two colors, black and white are always accessible, but you can have um, three different sizes and it might be accessible at a large size, but it's not accessible at a small size because it that at that size that the contrast is just too, it's not distinct enough. Um, and again, don't use text on a color background as a picture. No. So it's not just blind, it's also low vision that you're, we're working with. So not color blind, not blind, not just blind, not just color blind, but also low vision. So I might have to expand the text or make it bigger. Um, yeah, scanned PDFs are wholly inaccessible. No. No, Kurt, that does not mean hitting enter at twice at the end of each line. I hope you're asking that rhetorically, right? Okay, good. <laughs> I had faith that you knew that one. That is not the way you do that. And I'll show you when we get to Word if you want me to. Um, next one, tables. Um, tables. I think I get the most pushback from people who use Excel and tables. So tables are used for only tabular data, never for formatting. Don't use tables in a Word document to get text to be on the page where you want it to be. You can use columns. You can't use tables because columns are read in order. Um, the way a screen reader reads a table is it reads the heading row and then the first cell and then the heading row and the second cell and then the heading row and the second, the third row and the heading row and the third row, second cell. It uses the heading row to tell you what it is as to announce the next thing. So only, only, only for tabular data school, grad year, uh, number of graduating students. Great, that's a table, use it all day long. Okay, it has, every table has to have alt text. So the table itself has to have alt text to say what the table is. And you can't have blank cells in the table. So um, in Excel, we're commonly putting in this, you know, putting in blank cells between things to make room, to make it beautiful. Um, screen readers stop at blank cells and don't go on. So. Yeah. I'm sure Heather can help you fix it. All right. Next, alt text. So every non-text item must be addressed. So every non-text item <laughs> must be addressed. Every picture, every line, every box, everything, everything, everything must be addressed. You can use a double quote. So like that quote, quote, this is really hard to explain in words. That's why I have it on the screen. So quote, quote, like that. So that not a single quote, but a double quote twice for decorative items. So if you're if you have a line on the page as a separator for a visual separation, but it doesn't mean mean anything, like you're not actually separating the data, right? That can do you can just put a quote quote in the alt text. And that tells the screen reader to ignore that item and just move on. So it doesn't get announced to the screen reader at all. So um Use it liberally. If you have a picture of cute puppies on your screen, like if I had a picture of cute puppies on here, just to make sure you were paying attention to what I was talking about, because cute puppies are cute and you're looking at them. Does that tell you anything about alt text? Are the cute puppies relevant to what I'm talking about? Or is it just an attention getter for those of you who are visual? It's just an attention getter for those of you who are visual. It does not need alt text 
well, yes, <laughs> more puppies and kittens, always. Um, there is linked on this page one of the most useful things ever, and it is an alt text decision tree uh, put out by WC3. They're the experts on all things accessibility for digital stuff. They tell you in a decision tree, do you need alt text? And if you need alt text for like a complex image or something that's a little more difficult than the straight picture, um, they will tell you how to do the alt text, what needs to be in it. It is one of the most useful resources on the web ever. Um, it's one of the ones you're going to want to look up if you don't know about it already. All right, named links. I'm going to take a moment, drink some coffee. So no exposed links unless you're in, intended for print. Documents intended for print have to have exposed links. If I put this this link at the bottom of the page on a printed document, could be anybody actually click on a piece of paper and go to that link? The answer is no, of course. So there has to be an exposed link on a printed document. Yes, thank you. That's the that's the link, Heather. Um, but you can't have an exposed link on a digital document. So if it's not intended for print, it has to be a hidden link or a named link. So you can't use click here. You probably shouldn't read more. Um, you need to use words that describe the destination to anchor the link. You do want to use a mail to link to anchor an email address. So I could type my email address and make it a mail to link. Um, and this link down here is a link to a video that is me explaining how to do named links um, as a FAST 15. So I think it's like eight minutes long. Um, FAST 15s around here are a single actionable skill in 15 minutes or less. So how do you do something? One, how do you do one something in less than 15 minutes? And I made this one, I don't know, a couple of years ago now um, on how to do named links. And so as an example of named links and as a way to explain how to do named links, it's in here. And it covers both how to do it with a mouse and a keyboard in case you happen to be a mouse or a keyboard person. All right, next slide. So questions about all of those digital accessibility things about, um, uh, sorry, David, <laughs> I did not go down. Still a mouse. Trackballs are still mice. They're specialized mice, but. Questions about accessibility, those general things. And Carol, I didn't follow back up with you on the, you know, the the why piece. Is the why? Do you think the why piece is going to be helpful for your staff um, to understand that it's not just something that we do because we're obligated to do it, but because it matters? Because you probably have students. Yeah, it is a shift in mindset and culture. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, ultimately, when I've convinced people here that they need to be accessible, it's because I've sat down with them and their document and helped them understand how to make their document accessible. Ultimately, it's a one by one transformation we get this transformation sort of as a culture. Um, and it's not just me here, right? It's all the people that have done file accessibility that got all of our tier one documents up. So if it was just me running around one by one, helping all 600 of our staff, it would never happen. Um, but all those people who did all that remediation, taking every opportunity to help someone else understand how to make their own files accessible is probably how we're going to make the most difference. Um, 
because people don't really buy into this until it's their own stuff. I sat down with one of our um, research analyst type people who take the incoming data that all of our districts give us and do a report. And she had a page and a half of instructions on how to take the raw data that comes in from all of our districts and create it in and make it into a spreadsheet and then make it um, searchable and filterable. And it was a page and a half of instructions of how, what all the steps that they needed to do to make it work. And she said, I, I, you're telling me I have to do this accessibility stuff and how am I supposed to do this? And oh my gosh. And I said, well, in Excel, the best thing to do is to make it into a table. So would you do me a favor and just highlight all the data in the sheet and choose insert table and make sure you check I have header rows. And she did and she went, what? And it turns out that's all she had to do. And her page and a half of instructions went down to three lines. And the whole thing was accessible in the end. Because all the filtering and sorting and all the stuff that she had to set up manually was just done for her. So uh, when it's better for everyone and when it is easier, yes, those are the great moments. Those are the wins. But ultimately, it was me helping her with her stuff that convert, convinced her that accessibility was probably the right thing to do every time. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Uh, turning on outline view in Word and in even in Google Docs is probably one of the fastest way to help people understand how to use headings well. And using headings well is addicting. At least it is for me. Um, so being able to move around a document quickly, especially a large document, um, is just super helpful. Um, so that's one of the ways I can get people convinced to use headings well. And then once they start realizing the power of headings, then the next step is, oh, so now let's take you to the next step of what what's going to help you be better at being you. So uh, let's see. How are we doing on time? Stephen, honestly, I've lost track. <laughs> we are scheduled to go until 9.45. Thank you. Uh, OK. Just so you all know, I woke up at 2.30 this morning thinking, <gasps> I forgot to put a slide in. Um, yes. Yeah. 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 Using the tools and as intended. Absolutely. Is it? <laughs> yeah. Using tools for good. Um, all right. I'm going to run through the tool specific stuff, starting with HTML. I know we've got some programmers in here and the HTML stuff will probably matter to them. Um, but honestly, there is a when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, Kurt. Come on. Um, I, there's some resources at the end that, that of each of these sections that I think that you guys will find useful and helpful in what you're trying to do. So that's the big thing. So we're using web, the web accessibility guidelines that, that we use at ODE are the WCAG, because <laughs> you got to pronounce everything. Who wants to say WCAG every time? Um, WCAG 2.0 AA, that's the agreement that we had with OCR. The current guidelines are WCAG 2.1. Um, if you're starting accessibility with HTML in particular, you'll want to just go straight to 2.1. It's not that big of a difference, um, but you might as well just go straight for the big guns. Oh, sorry, that's the next line, Stephen. Um, those are linked for you. Those are linked to the actual guidelines. All right, next one. Um, so this is not my forte. This is why I have an eight on my team. 
he knows all this stuff. But I know this well enough, I think, to talk about it a little bit at least. So when you are when you're writing text, there has to be HTML wrappers around every single piece of the text on a web page. So uh, on this first example, they're missing something that wraps the paragraph. And so the correct version is that they have paragraph markers around that text. Okay, next one. You can't have empty tags. So it's fun that yours is highlighted. That's amazing. Um, so you notice that there are empty P's all over this page. Those are all wrong. The only P's that the P tags that should be on this tag, this page at all, are the ones of the the ones that are around the actual paragraph. And I don't know if you see that, but there's an empty span tags inside the paragraph, and those span tags don't need to be in there because those are also empty. All right, next. So here's header order in HTML. Uh, that, that's an ampersand, Cameron. Yeah, there is lots of tools to help with that. I don't know, Cameron. Um, my email address is at the end. And if you want to ask me that very specific question, I'll ask someone who could actually answer it for you and get back to you. So when it comes to all this HTML stuff, I'm not going to have really great answers for you, but I know who knows. <laughs> yes, most of the web authoring tools constantly puts in MTP tags. That's why we have uh, three. Yeah. Um, so header order, we talked about header order. This is what it looks like in the, in, in, but I want you to notice that one of the things we've done in CSS around here is if we want H3 to look a particular way, we give it a class in CSS, and then that class becomes part of the attributes for header three, and it looks different even though it is a header three and it is correct in the heading order. So you can fix some of this stuff in CSS. So you can fix, fix the look and feel in CSS that doesn't affect the header order in HTML. All right, next. Um, I, I think I beat it, this one with a dead horse now. Um, I've said it for three or four times. Don't put text in an image. Don't make an image that is only text. All right, next. Language, um, so lang identifying Spanish largely. Um, so you have to say that the language for the text on the page is Spanish, but then you also have to say the language that is of the that of the reference is Spanish. So the language of the document you're linking to is also Spanish, and there are different. So the language of the text that follows is Spanish and the language of the text of the thing that is linked to is Spanish are two different things. Um, and that that language is here on the slide for you. So it's it's lang and href lang. So next, this is fun. <laughs> uh, the picture is incorrect, just so you know. That's the incorrect example on this page. Uh, this is actually one of our web pages that we had to fix. Each of you can't have the same name on of a link on a page. So on this page, we had links that said English, Spanish, English, Spanish, English, Spanish, and that's how they were announced to the screen reader. So the screen reader heard English, Spanish, English, Spanish, English, and Spanish. What? It didn't know. Um, so you had to change what the screen reader was hearing so that they knew that it was, in fact, the Apple family's letter newsletter in English and the Apple family newsletter in Spanish. So uh, you had to make each of those links, we, we did, um, our nutrition folks had to make each of those language, each of those links different from the other so that the screen reader knew what it was looking at. It looks beautiful and the screen reader couldn't understand it. 
So again, all that language is on here for you. All right, next. So when you convert to an ordered list, it's going to put it in, uh, unless you also put it in an inline list, it's going to display it in a paragraph. So you have to both put it in an order list and put it in line, which means that it lines it up nice and neat on the side. And then page titles. Um, it turns out that you can actually fail an audit. We did. We had a, an audit finding from our independent auditor, auditor uh, because we had page titles that were incorrect. And we don't control page titles. The people that create the pages create control page titles. Um, and here's some incorrect, actual incorrect um, things that we had to start with. When it turns out the correct one is high school math assessment colon Oregon Department of Education. Um, so full information about what that. Uh, we used um, I'll look it up. Um, it's actually uh, I can't remember the name, but I can tell you that it is an auditor that works with inmates. So they pull a whole copy of your website down offline and edit it offline. Okay, good. <laughs> um, yeah, and they did two audits for us. So they did an audit at the beginning to help us get started and then an audit at the end to make sure that we'd done what we could do. So thanks. Like I have a tab open somewhere with their stuff on it, so I'm, I know I can find it. I just don't have it off the top of my head. Okay. Um, all right, in the slide deck, the next three slides are hidden. They are there for you. When we posted our, um, we had a, we're in the final stages of interviewing for uh, the three that we that ISS three for the web accessibility technician, and I go went ahead and put in the examples that we listed as the test that they needed to take. Um, so you could practice if you really wanted to practice on your HTML skills. I put the test that we used in there to see if see if you could do it because we've covered all the things that we talked about in there, and so you could practice. So. Those are all hidden. So we'll go down to the more information about, yes, access to online. That's exactly who it is. Thanks, Cameron. Um, this is a web page that is a public web page because our accessibility stuff has to be a public website. But all, so all of the documentation that our ISS8, our huge, I mean, our, our master web, I mean, he's incredible. <laughs> He he understands accessibility in a way that I never will for HTML in particular. He all of his documentation is out on our public website. Um, you are more than welcome to go dig around in it and see what he's got up there. He's got details about all kinds of stuff that I can't possibly understand because it's also very technical. Um, it's it's guaranteed to be accurate. I, I can't begin to tell you how much research has gone into this, um, but, but we're not going to help you with it. Um, he's very protective and private, and he doesn't want to be chopped out to the entire world. But what you find there, you can count on to be accurate. And if you really, really, really want some additional information, email me, and I'll negotiate with him for you. So um, one of the things that is hardest about web accessibility is that you do a web search and you find information and then you do another web search and you find different information. They are in direct conflict with one another. Um, it's one of the biggest frustrations. Um, in fact, we in a couple uh, in one instance, the audit findings we found once were in direct conflict conflict with the audit findings we found another time. And it's because it's so hard to get accurate accessibility information, even with the standards. Like, what does that actually mean when you're talking about HTML? How does that actually work? And um, our, our eight is just relentless about understanding that kind of stuff. And that's the fruits of all of that work. So 
I think it's probably one of the best things I'll give you, honestly. So questions about HTML? Yes, Kurt, I know you do. Kurt and I have been talking about this whole OCR thing for a couple of years now, so. Uh, we have not resort, resorted to drinking together yet, but possibly. Well, right? So that's a thing where we don't even know. Uh, All right, let's go through the office tools. And then we'll have some time. Yes, that's the flip side of guidelines is that they're not specific. I need more liquid. All right, so each of the Microsoft applications, both for desktop and Microsoft 365 has onboarding onboard accessibility tools. If you've not ever noticed them, they are there. Um, they, they, like the flip side, if you go to the next slide, Stephen, is that there are no onboard, onboard accessibility tools in Google, at Google at, at this time. Of course, it's Google things could change. So all accessibility checking in Google is human. That'd be you. So you have to, all those accessibility rules that we went through before about headings and alt text and, and all that stuff, right? That's, you have to know that stuff in order to do accessibility in Google. Yay. Um, so I do accessibility in Google in my sleep and most people don't. All right. Um, it, oh, one of the one of the big, huge gotchas. I don't know. Do I say that later? I'm going to say it now because it's a big, huge gotcha. Um, at least around here, we got sharing. Well, and probably most of education sharing was first available, and co-editing was first available in in Google, not in Microsoft. And so people got really, really used to creating um, shared slide decks in Google. Like, well, we can co-edit them and we're gonna make them together and we're gonna put them in Google. Well, they, um, yeah, just stay here. Go ahead, Steven. Um, they, so we all co-edited files in Google. Well, then we wanna convert them to PowerPoint. Why, I don't know, but they do. Um, so they convert them to PowerPoint when you convert a Google deck to PowerPoint, if you look at um, reading order, it converts every single item on the, the slide to ampersand, it's got just gobbledygook basically. Um, you don't know what's a title, you don't know what's a text box, you don't know what's a picture. They, they're all the same thing, they're all the same named Yes, yes, you can share a PowerPoint slide, but because we didn't have 365 and we didn't buy into 365 um, and we've remained Google, I don't know. Yes, when you convert a PowerPoint deck, I'm sorry, when you convert a Google deck to PowerPoint, it completely messes up accessibility. It is faster to start your deck all the way over in PowerPoint and copy and paste. So, um, make up your decision about what you're gonna use and start there and stay there. Uh, don't try to move from one to the other. It's better going from PowerPoint to Google, but again, why? Why would you do that? You could share both. They're both, you can co-edit in both now. There's no reason to move from one to the other. Stick with one. Okay. All right, let's talk about Word. So, Go ahead to the next one. Uh, using the ruler in Word is a really important thing to do. So you can set tabs on the ruler. And if you want, we can try if to have me share my screen again. We'll see, because uh, I can show you all this stuff in Word if you need me to. Um, use the paragraph in line spacing. You guys know what paragraph in line spacing is? I get a thumbs up or a question or a huh or a okay. So paragraph and line spacing. Um, 
that's that like use you don't add extra returns i know kurt was joking about it earlier you don't do enter enter you use paragraph and line spacing to make more space at the end of your paragraph um you can also change the format of a specific style so if you have text typed on the page and you do the formatting for that text like you want to make heading one look a particular way and you get the text all formatted exactly the way you want it to you can go to heading one on your styles bar right click heading one and mo and say um modify existing style to match the existing modify the style to match the existing text and it will update that style to look like the text on the page. It's a fast way to modify all of your headings one throughout the document. Um, if you, uh, same with all the headings or any of the styles in the document. Um, so you can modify the look and feel of a style and still keep it with its label and your document's still fine. So the label is what matters, not what, how the label makes the text look. So. I have a coworker who's autistic and very loud, so sorry. Um, so tables in Word. So there's two things you have to do on, with tables in Word. Um, we have you on the formatting for there's when you have a table selected in Word, you get two additional tabs at the top and the ribbons. Um, on the design row, you've got. Um, You've got, uh, <laughs> right? Yeah, we're not typing, we're word processing. That's a very great, that's a very big distinction. And thankfully, we're in the age, Kurt, where we're not, um, we're not dealing with as many typists anymore. I'm still a typist. I'm not anymore, but that's why I was trained. Um, Okay, so back to tables in Word. There's two additional things that show up on your ribbon when you've got a table open. And on the um, layout, I forget which is which because I don't have it open right now. On one, you have to designate first on a header row. And then on the second one, you have to say repeat header row across pages. Even if your table doesn't go across pages, you have to click that. And that's what tells Word that you actually have a header row. So clicking that first checkbox on the first tab, on the first ribbon, doesn't actually tell Word you have a header row. It's clicking both together that tells Word that you have a header row. That's what makes it fully accessible. Really annoying. Um, also, um, putting alt text in, so you right click the table and alt text is available to you on the context menu for your tables. Uh, so alt text for images and shapes in Word is under um, file uh, and is under it's under the context menu and it's under oh geez. See, I thought I was going to be sharing Word at this point, so I'm just going to open up Word. and draw a line so I can actually find I I know all these instinctively and so I don't know how to do them without okay so if you go to format picture and then you go to size and position which is the um, it looks like a, a box with lines on the outside and a, a crosshair in the middle. Alt text is underneath there. And you don't need to put anything in the title bar in there. Um, in alt text, you just need to put something in description. And the description needs to be, again, either that quote quote to say this image doesn't matter, or it needs to be a description. And again, I would refer you back to that alt decision tree. It will tell you exactly about what to put in the alt text box. Um, yes. Yeah. Kurt, viewing a web page on their computer and then viewing the same web page on their phone is an effective way to do that. Um, so. Uh, all right. 
Alt text in Word is one of the harder things for people to find because it's like three or four clicks. So it's really annoying. All right, title in Word. This is not the title of the document like the title of the document you find in styles. This is the title of the document you find in the properties of Word. So you have to go into file and on the info page in file, which is the, the page that comes up on in the file menu, there is under properties, there is a title there. That's the title that you need to enter. There's also other really interesting things in there that you might want to add. So tags is in there. And if you're using, if you're in a SharePoint environment, you probably are, understand the power of tags and why you would want to put tags into a document. Um, so there's all kinds of stuff in there, but that's the title that you're thinking about. That's the title that you need to put in to make it uh, accessible. All right. Excel. <laughs> right. Yeah, reusing documents ends up with some really interesting properties in there. I found a document, and I can't remember where, while working here at ODE, and the owner was HP, like as in Hewlett Packard. And I was like, <laughs> Really? How did we end up with a document that the owner is a, that's ah, going to be fun. So, um, so um, Excel accessibility. Um, I mentioned data tables already, but uh, go ahead and, yep. Uh, data tables in Excel are the way to go. So if you have just data tables, that is the, if you just have data in a table, that's the way to go is changing it into a data table. Again, that makes it so that you can um, sort and filter and do all the beautiful, lovely things. You can stripe. That's where all those beautiful layouts that you see in Excel come into play. So you can change how it looks and it's just fun. Um, <clears throat> and it remains fully accessible the whole time. But of course, check color contrast. Um, next in Excel, you have to have unique names. So your sheet names need to be unique. Um, and they should probably not be sheet one, sheet two, sheet three. They should be actually something that means something, like you should name your sheet something. <laughs> um, and your column headings can't be the same. So you would also want to name your column heading, column heading something that means something. Um, but you couldn't like say columns as back to that picture with all of the flyers on it. You couldn't say English, Spanish, English, Spanish, English, Spanish for columns. You would have to give them separate names that meant something more. Because again, when you're reading a data table, when a screen reader is reading a data table, if you've got um, first row and first column marked, it reads, it announces those things and then reads the data. It's really hard to listen to really really hard to listen to so all right let's talk about powerpoint in particular so slide titles every single see when's the next slide every single title or slide must have a title so one of the things that happens like oh, this is our default um, template that ODE asks us to, asked us to use for all of our slides, which is fine. Um, if I were to grab that title, like I don't want, I don't want that white thing up at the top, and I don't want to bother reformatting it. I want something black. I just hate. Oh my God! There's somebody in our agency that hates having titles on the right side of the screen. It's just wrong to them. So they're going to grab that thing and just delete it and add a text box that's black at the top of the slide to be the title of the slide. They've just made the slide inaccessible because what they've done is deleted the text box that is marked as a title and just added a new text box. And so now the slide doesn't have a title. So if you've deleted the title off the, off the slide for whatever reason, or if you've inherited a slide deck where the title's been deleted, honestly, the best way is to just insert a new slide because a new slide will always come with a title. And copy and paste the information into the new slide and start over again. It's just not worth it to try to fix it. It's faster to just do it that way. Um, so 
if I look at slide, would you go back two slides for me? No, back two, Stephen. One more. So do you see the title on this slide where it says Unique Names Excel? And then go forward to Stephen. And this one says Unique Names PowerPoint. So I have two, I mean, unique names are clearly a thing, right? But they're different for Excel and PowerPoint. And I have two different unique names slides, but in order to make them distinct and different, they have the name of the product that I'm talking about to make them different from each other, even though they're both unique name slides. So that's one way to make your slides titles unique. All right. Next. Reading order in PowerPoint is anti-intuitive, like the opposite of intuitive all the, all the time. If you're looking at reading order in PowerPoint, it is from the bottom to the top, not from the top to the bottom like we all think it should be. So if you open up the reading, the selection pane, it's called the selection pane in PowerPoint. If you look at the selection pane, the title should be at the bottom of the list and you should read from the bottom to the top. So, um, really annoying. I had somebody who reordered the whole deck from top to bottom. <laughs> I said, no, sorry, it's bottom to top. And they're like, oh my gosh, I have to reorder my whole deck. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, all right, so a couple of resources for you around file accessibility. Um, these are built in Canvas. So if you have Canvas and want to get the deck for yourself or get the course for yourself, we're happy to share. It's openly licensed on purpose. Um, so, but they're on our Canvas and you can have them. You can just link to them anytime you want. The first is called Making Content Accessible. And this is our training for our staff on um, Word, PowerPoint and Excel, and it has all the concepts that we've talked about today, plus the how to, like, how do you make all these things happen in each of the applications? So headings is in each of each in Word and PowerPoint and Excel, well, probably not in Excel, but um, Word and PowerPoint have headings built into them. And how do you do headings in each of these things? And how do you make that happen? Um, videos were appropriate, all kinds of supporting information. Um, and that's something that when we get the position hired that we're waiting for, that's something that they'll be in there and updating on a regular basis. So if they find a great video on YouTube, or if they make a video, um, hmm, that's fun. Okay, well, I'll type them in here. Um, so making content accessible is Rats making content accessible. And I'll have to get the link to the, well, that, does it need, I'll get the, the accessibility link from, for HTML42. Um, and an advanced accessibility is, um, is Adobe. So it's built on Adobe 2, uh, keep, go, go back one more, Stephen. Is Adobe 2017 Pro? Um, and if you open up the modules link, let me type it in. I can't talk and type at the same time. Um, it is, if you open up the modules link in accessibility and you open up the accessibility report in Adobe, they match one-to-one. -one. So page errors and page errors, and then each of the errors matches up. So if you're looking for a particular error in Adobe, you can navigate this in the same order in the advanced accessibility course in Canvas to find exactly how you can fix that error. Um, it is, I, I don't bother remembering how to do anything in Adobe because of that training. I just go look it up when I need it. There's no reason that um, there's no reason to even care about <laughs> how to do anything. Um, there's a couple of things that we've discovered since it was written for us a couple of years ago. Um, 
again, those are things that are going to get updated. When we get somebody in that position, I just don't have time to deal with that right now, but I'm writing them all down. Um, so we have that content that's ready to go. All right. I just have one more slide and then we can, which is just me. That's my address. My email address, you're welcome to. Um, you're welcome to email me with questions. Um, when we eventually hire our person who does file accessibility and stuff, I'll just forward you on to that person. But for now, that's me. Um, and again, I'm happy to negotiate with a, with our, our um, webmaster who may or may not be able to help you with your web stuff. Um, um, but I'm happy to take questions or thoughts or rants or anything that you might want to talk about around accessibility. Um, virtual drinks with Kurt and I. Well, since I don't hear lots of questions or comments, Stephen, do you want to wrap things up? And I think I'm going to go hang out at a table in the lounge. If anybody has advanced questions or just wants to, you know, chat, I will be there to, to do that. Great. Thank you so much, Melissa. And thank you, everyone else. Enjoy the rest of ACP. Mm -hmm.